So we are in the second, second week of Lent. It's that time of Lent when if you have chosen to give, it, give up something in your life, perhaps maybe it is bothering you just a little bit. Uh, you could come over to my house today. I have chocolate. I'm making light of a traditional Lenten ritual called fasting. And I make light of it in the best possible way. I understand what fasting is about. And I believe that there are times when something has taken over our lives in such a way that it is damaging our relationship with God that we must separate ourselves from it. We know that Jesus fasted and prayed. And in that fasting, what we come to realize as we understand about Jesus' life on earth is that he did that ritual because he was using it as a time to pull himself out of all the other distractions around him and to get close with God. And that's one of the reasons why in the Lenten season we fast from certain things that might be interrupting our relationship with God. Fasting in and of itself is not a bad thing unless, of course, you happen to be doing it just for the sake of the ritual and at the end of the fast you don't seem to be any closer to God than you were when you began it. Let me say that again. Fasting is not a bad thing. If there's something that's in the midst of your relationship with God that is taking your focus off of God and distracting you away from God in this world, fasting from it is not a bad thing. However, if at the end of the fast where you've subtracted something out of your life so that you can focus more on God, if at the end of it your whole goal is to just go right back to that thing, perhaps, maybe, Fasting was more about one's own control than about God in the first place. I'll tell you a little story about when I began to think about that. As a child, I didn't quite understand what it was God had to do with chocolate, right? I, I still to this day, to this day with all of the stuff that's going on in the world right now, do you honestly think that at the top of God's list, is number one priority, make people stop eating chocolate. Now, let me caveat that just a little bit. Perhaps at the top of God's list, number one priority, help people understand that to have that in their life, there's a lot of pain that occurs. There is pain attached with our chocolate consumption, but that's a completely different sermon and I'll go that direction a different day. But I really don't honestly think that God is worried about us giving up chocolate or giving up soda or giving up Cheetos or whatever it is. I don't really think that that is high on God's priority list. But I know that we have been conditioned to believe that it is. I know that throughout history, fasting has gone from being that ritual where we are trying to become closer to God into that idea of I'm going to do this and I'm going to control it and prove to myself just what I can do. So I really started to think about fasting. I really started to begin to understand that it has become sort of an empty ritual in our lifetimes. On the day that someone came to me and reported to me how pleased and how impressed they were with themselves that they had given up watching their favorite reality television show for Lent. And I was like, that's, that's wonderful. That, I mean, sometimes we have to ask ourselves, why are we watching television shows that cause pain in other people's life? Why are we watching television shows that are manipulative of our own mindsets? And I thought, that's wonderful. That's great. I'm so glad you gave that up. That's not good for you anyway. Oh, I didn't give it up completely, Pastor Jana. I'm TiVoing it. Remember TiVo? That was the precursor to DVR. I'm TiVoing every episode so that the minute that Easter is over, I can sit down on Monday and start watching my shows again. I think the point was missed there. And one of the reasons why I always focus in on chocolate is because another person came to me and said, I am giving up chocolate for Lent. I'm just, I just know that I have to give it up. And I have two dove promises on my bedside table 
and the minute I wake up after midnight on Holy Saturday, it'll be Easter Sunday morning and I am eating that chocolate. I think the point is missed. When we're just treading water as it is throughout these 40 days and six Sundays of subtracting out of our lives those things that bring us such joy sometimes and using it as a way for us to feel pious or to feel noticed for the great sacrifice that we are using. And you know what else I noticed when I was talking with folks who would tell me about what they were giving up is about the second week of Lent, I began to hear a lot of yearning. Not yearning for God, but yearning for that thing that had been removed from their life. I can't wait until Lent is over so I can have my chocolate. I can't wait until Lent is over so I can have another martini. I can't wait until Lent is over so that I can watch my television program again. And I also began to hear a lot of complaining complaining about what was missing in their lives, complaining about how bad the world was, complaining about everything around them because they had subtracted themselves from a joy in their life and they were missing it and they were doing it for the ritual rather than doing it to grow closer to God. You know, what is the point of fasting? if at the end of it, you are not closer to God. So I decided to do an experiment. I decided to do an experiment with one of my disciple classes and I said, hey, would you all join me in this experience? Instead of fasting from something during this Lenten season, would you all try feasting upon the glory of God with me. Now, at first there was some resistance to that. There was resistance to that because of the fact that we have been conditioned throughout our histories and throughout our society and throughout our religious society that Lent means we have to experience some sort of pain in our life. That if we don't experience that pain of Lent in our lives, there is absolutely no way that we've done it correctly. I think if we think about it, we've all experienced a lot of fasting this year already, haven't we? We've experienced fasting in a way that has separated us from loved ones, separated us from employment, separated us from our church. I think that we've separated ourselves from something that we love. We have been fasting for almost a year now. And in the midst of that fasting, are we Getting to the point where we're yearning for God yet would be my question. Anyway, I talked to my disciple class and after we got past the original resistance of giving up fasting for Lent and instead focusing upon feasting upon God's gifts in our midst, everybody around the table came back the next week and said, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I am going to feast upon the joy in my life. In other words, I am going to spend time finding joy all around me. I'm going to feast upon hope. I am going to pay attention during this Lenten season to the stories of hope that I'm hearing all around me. One person said, I'm going to combine the two, Pastor Jana. I'm going to fast from the television news and I am going to feast upon feel good stories that show me about how hope is in this world. Another person said, I'm going to feast on love and I'm going to look at all of the ways that God's love is abundant around us. And you know what happened? about the second week of Lent during that particular exercise. Instead of hearing yearning for the things that they were missing, instead of hearing all of the complaining and the grouchiness and the irritableness about having to go through Lent anyway, everybody started to come into disciple class and all of a sudden they would get derailed in stories and they would say, oh, can I please share the story of love that I feasted on this week? Can I please share the story of hope that I had a feast with this week? And it was a disciple class that to a person came to me that Easter morning in church and said, Pastor Jana, 
This has been the best Lenten journey we have ever taken. Today, I really understand what that symbol of the cross means in my life. It means that Christ is with me, that Christ is always going to be with me. Because I have focused upon, I have feasted upon the good abundance around me, I know today that Christ is alive and with me. You see, what I came to understand is, is that in those Lenten times when we focus so heavily upon the, the nature of harm and darkness, that sometimes people would come to Easter Sunday morning and the ritual would be either they were so happy for Lent to be over or they would see the cross as a horrible thing and they did not ever want to talk about being people who in our world bore crosses for others or they simply just saw Easter as just another opportunity to gather family together. When I did that experiment with that disciple group where we focused on looking at the good things in our lives, in other words, fasting from focusing on the bad things. That entire group of disciple students had an epiphany. They had an instance where they understood that the bridegroom, as the scriptures from this morning called Christ, that Christ was always in our midst. And so why do we go through these exercises where we focus on every bad thing? Because Christ our joy, our hope, our love is always with us. I particularly like this story about uh, the Pharisees and John's disciples, John the Baptist disciples coming to Jesus and saying, why are our discipleships fasting? Why are our disciples fasting? And why are your disciples not. You see, they're trying to set Jesus up again to say something that they think that they can trap him with. But in the scripture, this particular story comes right after the story of Jesus calling Levi, Matthew, the tax collector. And, and Jesus is all about the fact that he's opening wide a table of inclusion. He's opening wide a table of inclusion. And he's saying to them, don't you understand? Don't you get it? That my disciples, the ones that I'm calling forward, they're beginning to understand that the abundance in their midst means that they don't have to focus on the darkness any longer. They can fast from that stuff for the rest of their lives. But when they realize that I'm in their midst, they're going to celebrate. They're going to lift up the good things. They're going to open the table. They're going to include others. They're going to go out into this world and they are going to help people. Don't you understand that they are feasting on the glory of God? I am with them. They are feasting on all of God's good gifts. Don't we understand that God is with us. And in the midst of that, in the midst of Christ being right at our center, there is such great feasting available to us. The feasting of hope in this world, the feasting of joy, the feasting of seeing one another on the video that we do every week for Passing of the Peace. That to me is such a glorious feast of God's love in our presence. Christ is saying to the ones who are trying to trap him into old ritualistic ways, he has come to be a new way for us, to show us a new way to live in God's glory. He uses an example that they all know about. They all know that if they have an old wineskin and they put new wine in it, new wine that is bubbling and fermenting and forming, that all of a sudden the old wineskin is going to break apart and they're going to lose everything that they have put in it. He uses that familiar image to say to them, look, what I am doing is new. 
What I am doing is about the kingdom of God. It's not about the old ways of worry and hoarding and denial and, and being left in places where you feel that you are abandoned. The new way that we work in this world with the advent of Christ is that there is always abundance around us. Jesus tells these ones trying to trap him, trying to trap him so that they can have a reason to get rid of him, that his disciples have begun to understand that the message he's bringing from the kingdom is pointing us toward going to a new direction. And if people don't recognize that gift in the middle of the community, then perhaps maybe it's time to rethink the way we've always done things. Perhaps, maybe, it's time for us to rethink how we've done things that have not acknowledged the presence of Christ in our midst. Now, I think it's a legitimate a question for someone to say to me, but Pastor Jana, doesn't feasting mean gluttony? Doesn't feasting mean overindulging? Doesn't feasting mean having everything that you want around you? In one sense, yes, it does. But in another sense, to feast means to be thankful for that which you have. To know that every need that you have is satisfied and to understand that there is a difference between a need and a want. Can I just say, as much as I love it, I don't need chocolate. I want it. But when it is in my midst, my response is to be thankful for it. Feasting can be about turning our attitude from that which we lack into that which we always have around us and becoming people who walk in gratitude for the simplest things. Isn't it a feast in our lives to have warmer weather in the midst of a winter that we thought was going to overtake us and make everything around us so much more painful? Isn't it a feast to see the smile of a child in our midst? Isn't it a feast to hear your favorite song on the radio and be grateful for the uplifting that it brings you? Isn't it a feast to be able to sit down and simply have a meal, to know that there is food in our midst? And yet, what I think we have done is we've put so much emphasis on what we lack, we tend to hoard. And when we tend to hoard, other people then suffer. I think that it is a better use of our spiritual gifts our spiritual time, our spiritual relationship with Christ to focus upon our gratitude for the things that we have that are so abundant in our lives that we can't help but want to share. Because we are so thankful for our abundance, we respond by sharing with others. You see, it's been my experience that when we realize that we lack for nothing, that we become people in our gratitude who are so much more generous with what we have. When we don't fear that things are going to be taken away from us, when we don't fear that we can't have what we want, and when we focus upon being grateful for what we have, it has been my experience through years of ministry that we become ever generous, more generous, each and every day of our lives. So, as I started with, I'm not against fasting, especially when fasting is a time when you are focused upon deepening a relationship, your relationship with God. But I have to question whether or not the way we do it now in this society at this particular time is about God or is it truly about ourselves? 
Is it truly about ourselves that we take this stuff away from us, we cause ourselves to go into lack because we want it to give us a certain level of spiritual superiority? If fasting leads us into more glory of God, that's fantastic. But if fasting is only leading us to that feeling on Sunday morning that we were somehow superior spiritually to a friend who didn't fast, I don't think that's on God's list of things to worry about today either. So the tough question that I think we have for ourselves today is, are you caught in that loop of fasting for fasting's sake? Or are you willing to step forward into feasting gratitude? If we feast in gratitude, the world around us looks so different than when we fast in darkness and begin to yearn for that thing we are missing. If we feast in gratitude, we begin begin to see we're missing nothing. God is with us. And what more could we want? I'm asking myself the question of how is it I can feast in this world upon God's greatness and goodness? Perhaps maybe that's a good Lenten focus for us this year. What if Lent was all about feasting rather than fasting? Amen.